Welcome back to Weekend Live. Let's get straight into our politicians panel. Joining us live from Canberra is Matt Keogh. He's a Labor MP. And from Sydney, the Liberal MP, Jason Filinski. Good to see you both again. Thank you for joining us. Let's start on this revelation we've you. seen about Neil Prakash. It turns out he's alive. Uh, the wanted alleged terrorist, uh, we were told six months ago by senior government ministers at a news conference um, that they were essentially celebrating his death via drone strike. Jason Filinski, is this somewhat embarrassing for the government? Well, look, Ashley, there's not a lot that I can say on this as this is a very fluid situation. What I can say is that Neil Prakash has been, or a man matching his description, has been detained by Turkish officials on the Syrian border. Um, the, gov the Australian government is working with Turkish officials to determine his identity. We've also officially lodged an extradition request with the Turkish government. They have their own processes to work through and we're working through those processes with them. Jason, the counter-terrorism experts we've been speaking with here on Sky News this morning have suggested that Australia really should be at the, the top of the pack in terms of that extradition order. Is the government confident that it will be able to negotiate this extradition to Australia? Well, I think this shows that the government's good working relationships with many international go well, many governments overseas shows that our ability to affect counter-terrorism policy is working quite well. So what we're hoping to do at this point is make sure that uh, we are at the top of the pack and hopefully the Minister for Counter-Terrorism, Michael Keenan, will have more to say on this as um, details emerge. Matt Keogh, to be fair to the government, it is very hard, we know, in this part of the world to confirm who is actually injured or killed in these sort of drone strikes. What's your take on this? We've had viewers emailing in, social media is full of comments saying we don't want him back in Australia. Is extradition the right course for the government to take here? Well, look, I think while it's mildly embarrassing for the government that they announced that Prakash had died and now he's been found alive, what is really the good news is that he's in custody, he's not out there causing uh, more issues and creating more terrorist activity and that is the really important part of this story and of course we're happy to see that result. Uh, we've sought uh, further information from the government as to what exactly they're going to be seeking in terms of extradition and other actions and where they might be ranking in the list of pursuing that. I understand that Part of that's going to be subject to what charges Turkey themselves may bring against Prakash. Uh, if they have serious charges to be bringing against him themselves, that will take precedence before any extradition requests are dealt with. Uh, but of course it's our obligation, if he is extradited, to make sure that he is prosecuted for his crimes and punished appropriately, which I'm sure would occur. Uh, all nations need to make sure, and Australia does, that it has the right laws in place and processes to punish terrorists if they do return to Australia and if the only place that he can receive proper punishment is in Australia then there is an obligation on the government to extradite him to make sure that he receives uh, that trial, those charges and is punished accordingly. Otherwise you risk leaving somebody like Prakesh back out there maybe suffering or you know having gone through only minor charges without uh, suffering the full weight of the law which we need to make sure occurs. Yeah, look, I think there's a lot more to come on this story, obviously, and as you've both pointed out, details still pretty thin on the ground as to exactly how all this came about and the timeline. We do know from a statement from a, a government official this morning that the government, the Australian authorities, were involved in the arrest with Turkish authorities. So Australia obviously knew that this was all coming. I think that's where we're probably going to end our note of bipartisanship, though. Let's look at some other political issues around today. The future of George Brandis, is it under a cloud? We've seen the New Daily uh, quoting today an anonymous senior cabinet minister saying the Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull is more than infuriated with George Brandis, who has had better weeks, of course. We saw him last Monday uh, in strife over the hot mic incident we revealed here on Sky News where he was caught out saying his LNP colleagues in Queensland are very mediocre. Yesterday there was a story from the West Australian newspaper revealing this uh, deal that was struck between the Commonwealth and the WA state government to help WA claw back a billion dollars from the collapsed Bell Group run by Alan Bond. The problem is that this deal 
seem to effectively put WA first in line ahead of other creditors, and that is uh, something that has been very controversial. Jason Falinski, Labor's saying George Brandis needs to go. They're suggesting this amounts to corruption, that the Prime Minister should sack him. Is George Brandis's future under a cloud? Well, look, I think Labor is just reckless on so many issues, and this is just another example. George Brandis is a very capable and able member of the Cabinet. This week he's presided over a Senate which has passed important pieces of reform, opposed, I might say, by the Labor Party. Um, and some of these reforms have been al almost four years in the making. So this week, as the head of the Senate, he's done, a, or as leader in the Senate, he's done a great job in getting um, reform bills through that are going to benefit hard-working Australians who are just trying to make a, be a better life for themselves in Australia. Matt Keo, is this an overreach from Labor? Is there any actual evidence that Absolutely George Brandis not. has been embroiled in corruption? Well, I think, you know, at best we've got here moral bankruptcy and, and at worst, you know, potential corruption here. I mean, let's look at what happened. We've got the Attorney General okay, of the so Commonwealth say potential corruption. cutting a deal. Is it corruption or not? Well, it's corrupt behaviour when you're basically selling the Commonwealth down the river by doing a deal with the state Liberal government to sort of give them an edge over all the other creditors, including effectively the, the Commonwealth, the taxpayers, the ATO, by directing a, a effectively um, government officers, the Solicitor General, to not run particular arguments. If that's what occurred, it's troubling to see a very senior Cabinet Minister cut a deal to promote his Liberal mates in Western Australia with some legislation that was clearly so bad the High Court threw it all out and said start again by saying that they wouldn't run arguments against it, cutting a deal that cut out the Australian taxpayer, the ATO, meant that the Commonwealth would be pushed further and further behind in priority in dealing with what it, uh, funds it should receive as part of the Bell Group liquidation. So, and let's not forget, this is just the last, as you said, Ashley, in, the, in a litany, really, of matters where George Brandis has caused the government pain, has been embarrassing the government, and I think, really, the question is, if George Brandis isn't going to resign, is Malcolm Turnbull going to act? As you said, it would appear that even other members of the Cabinet are acknowledging that this is causing the government serious problems. And so the question is, is Malcolm Turnbull going to sack his Attorney-General, which I think is what he needs to do? Jason Flinsky, I'll let you respond to that. And, and I'm yeah, keen well, to know if, you oh, do, if it does strike you as odd that this actual deal, when you look at the crux of it, this deal of putting the WA government ahead of a Commonwealth body being the ATO in line, essentially, for clawing back some of this money, it, it does seem odd on the surface if this report is true. Well, Ashley, I'm not across the details of this case. In fact, any tax law case is incredibly technical and difficult. So I'm not across the details. Bill Shorten's not across the details. Labor's not across the details. But that doesn't stop Well, actually, I am across the detail, because this is an issue that I've raised with the government before. And this that doesn't stop them you've from got to, this is this was, an obvious, this was an obvious issue. This was an obvious issue that okay, confronted that's... the state government. And I raised it with the state government when I was Law Society president last year. And I said, what are you doing about the fact that the ATO is going to have priority. And they said, oh, it's OK, the Commonwealth has agreed with us to let the legislation go through. They gave up money that should have been coming to the Commonwealth in order to help out a problem government in WA, Barnett's government, their Liberal mates, who, of course, are now about to go to a state election in March. This looks terrible for so, the sorry, government Matt, you've just got to a senior cabinet Matt, minister can I just doing confirm? this. OK, so, Matt Kay, can I just confirm that you're, you're saying that you've got direct uh, knowledge that this was the deal, that this actually, the report is, in fact, a correct, a, a correct account of what happened? I was told, I was told that the federal government was happy with the legislation that was being put through and it wouldn't get in the way. And that seems to be what okay. happened, and that's Jason what the Williams, state we, government we went into parliament and said... We will let you just finish because you were interrupted there. ...on Hansard. OK, oh. you've made your point, Matt Keogh. So, Jason well, Polinski, we'll let you finish up on this one. Well, um, thank you, Ashley. Look, all I can say is that it's reckless. Matt's saying that he's aware of um, things. Uh, he's not naming his sources of information. The reports don't name the Cabinet Minister. They're all anonymous. Um, we all know what that means. Um, you know, it is just reckless for people to be talking about this when they're not across the detail of the matter.
What it means is there's okay, clear look, divisions think, uh, in this I'm... government, actually. There's clear divisions when cabinet <laughs> yes. ministers are coming out and briefing against other cabinet ministers. Look, and Malcolm Turnbull sure needs to step Labor's in and I'm sure Labor's going to be pursuing this in this. question time this week. We're going to be hearing a lot more from Labor, no doubt. Uh, in question time this week, the final parliamentary week of, uh, of the year. It has been a long year, as uh, you both know, in the, in the federal parliament. Uh, at the end of last week, we saw the backpack attacks uh, fall down. Now, Jason Polinsky, Nick Xenophon, is essentially delivering an ultimatum to the government, saying he's not going to deal with the government legislation until a dispute over water flows under the Murray-Darling Basin plan is resolved. What's your understanding of what this means in practical terms? It looks like on the surface, the government may not be able to get that ABCC legislation through this week after all. Well, Matt, uh, well, Ashley, um, Matt and I haven't been there the whole year. We got elected in July, but it certainly feels like it's been a year. Um, I don't know how you feel about that. Um, and, but the huh. government has had a very successful week in the Senate. We have managed to pass pieces of legislation in this sitting um, calendar that have been held up for three and four years. Um, now, Nick Xenophon is always wanting to negotiate. That's his job as a crossbencher. He does that very well. In terms of water, uh, the water plan, um, the government has confirmed several times this week in the House of Reps, and I assume in the Senate as well, that nothing has changed with the water plan. So if um, Senator Xenophon is worried about um, the water plan and that's the condition on which he will be supporting the ABCC legislation, then I would have to say that it's looking very good for the government this week. Matt Keogh, is this fair, this approach we're seeing from Nick Xenophon? He said in the past that he's not into horse trading, but is this almost worse than horse trading, essentially holding the government to ransom over one pet issue? Uh, look, I don't think uh, it's necessarily a different approach we're seeing by Nick Xenophon. He he'll pick on a particular issue and use that to his advantage and the advantage of the state that he represents, and I don't think that's a new approach by crossbenchers across the board uh, to take that approach. But um, you know, obviously Labor has uh, very strong reservations and, and problems with the ABCC legislation, but it shows really fundamentally that the government has serious problems when it comes to dealing with the crossbench, if it's going to be held to ransom over this issue. I know the government keeps saying that what it's doing with Murray-Darling is completely in line with the plan, but that's clearly not the view that is being taken by those in South Australia who feel like they're being sold down the river, as it were, on this issue. And the government really needs to come crystal clear, because I don't think it is being crystal clear, about what it's doing with the National Water Plan in relation to Murray-Darling. OK. We are out of time. There is so much that we could discuss, but we need to move on. We appreciate you both joining us. Jason Polinsky, Matt Keogh, enjoy the final sitting week there in Canberra. It's going to be a big one. Of course, Ashley. <laughs> sure we will. Thanks a lot, Ashley. See ya.